Okay, let's start the second session where we have Joshua Brody as the first speaker. Uh, should I say first thanks uh, to the workshop organizers for inviting me. Um, so I want to talk about some new work that I've done with my collaborator Eric Blay at University of Waterloo. Um, this is about both strong direct sum and randomized query complexity. Um, I think there's a, uh, I like it as a, it's, I feel like it's a nice bag of little interesting things. So hopefully you will also find something interesting in this talk. Um, so I want to start by just recapping uh, direct sum kind of problems. So uh, in grad school, Amit always uh, kind of described this in terms of peeling potatoes. So uh, you've, you've got some function you want to compute. Um, how much resources does it cost to compute k times these resources? So a direct sum theorem might say that computing k copies uh, requires k times the resources. Uh, related is direct product. Uh, if you've got maybe some randomized computation model with error and you want to compute k copies with like somewhat less than k times resources, then a direct product theorem might say that the uh, success probability goes down exponentially with the number of things you're trying to compute. Um, so uh, I guess uh, our starting point is a strong direct sum result. And this is uh, related to direct sum. So in a computational model where you're computing k copies, um, and maybe it's randomness and with error, the naive thing does act actually doesn't cost just k times the resources. It costs more. Uh, the very naive thing to do is, is just uh, compute each one with error, say epsilon over k, and then take a union bound over that. Um, so uh, I'm going to call a strong direct sum theorem is a result that says computing k copies requires asymptotically more than k times the resources. Paul? So you're saying the error is the same in the final as in each the That's correct. Time? Yeah. So I want uh, computing k copies, <coughs> outputting all k of them, I want, I want to have overall error epsilon. And the naive solution is to compute each one individually with, with probability epsilon over k, and then union bound over everything. So the question is, uh, if, I, if I want out answers to all k of them with overall error, some reasonable epsilon, um, do I actually have to compute everything with low error? OK. Um, so uh, we study this in the model of randomized query complexity. Um, we've got a little bit of a twist. So we're allowing aborts here. So uh, if you haven't seen randomized query complexity before, uh, maybe you want to compute some function on an uh, n-bit string. Um, a decision tree is a labeled binary <coughs> tree. Uh, you start at the root, you probe that particular bit, and you go left or right depending on the value of that bit. Um, at the end, you output uh, some answer. And we're going to allow you to also abort. So the cost for a deterministic algorithm, a deterministic decision tree, is just the length of the longest path down to the root. Um, we'll be looking in the randomized setting. Um, the, I guess, easiest way to go from deterministic to randomized is you've just got a probability distribution over deterministic trees. Um, but for the most part in this talk, I'm going to view uh, randomized query algorithm as, as just a standard algorithm where I'm being charged for the inputs I'm probing. Um, so uh, most of you have uh, seen query complexity or communication complexity, I guess. There's a distributional version um, and a randomized version. And you can do minimax to show that these two are related. Um, so if uh, just notationally, if I ever say on the slide q delta epsilon, q is always the number of queries, delta always the abort probability, epsilon always the error probability. Um, so uh, two quick facts. Uh, uh, there's a minimax version. Uh, the abort and error probabilities are tweaked because we're, we're minimaxing over two different measures. And uh, standard error reduction, you can repeat things t times. Uh, this, this is a little bit better than you might think because you can drive down the abort and error probability at the same time. So. Uh, just to avoid a notational overload, I'm typically going to be stating results either distributionally or uh, for the randomized version, whichever one's more convenient for this particular result. 
And I'm going to leave it to you to connect the dots using minimax or error reduction. OK. Um, so uh, there are a lot of related works to this. Um, I'm going to give you the white meat here. Um, this strong direct sum result has been studied in the context of interactive information complexity, uh, complexity by Gregory and uh, David and Marco Molinaro. Um, so they have a nice result for interactive in information complexity. Uh, you get nice applications for scheming and sketching. Um, Drucker gave a direct product theorem. And there have also been some very nice recently randomized query complexity separations by Tony and, and Troy and others. Um, it, in particular, it was somewhat surprising to me that uh, the randomized query complexity of zero error versus bounded error was was not separated until two years ago, three years ago. Um, surprising to me. So this is uh, Drucker's main um, direct product theorem. So uh, if you've got a t-query algorithm with success probability 1 minus epsilon, um, then any query algorithm that uses tk times epsilon, maybe with some constant, um, has exponentially small success probability. Um, this epsilon is important. It, you, it needs to be there. And uh, the starting point for our research was an open problem of Drucker, which asks what the query complexity would be if you were allowed uh, little omega of t times k queries. So uh, our main results are as follows. Uh, we've got a strong direct sum distributional theorem um, in terms of uh, errors with aborts. So we show that to compute f of k with epsilon error, uh, you need to compute k times the resources of computing one copy with error like epsilon over k. Um, but you're also allowed to have a, a constant abort probability. Um, we also show a function where the uh, query complexity scales with log 1 over epsilon. Uh, this is robust to having aborts. So even if you're allowed to abort 50% of the time, the query complexity still scales with log 1 over epsilon. And again, this is uh, tight. So the naive thing to do, drive down the error, um, uses this log 1 over epsilon. Um, so the two taken together shows uh, that there is a function with optimal blow up in the number of resources. So k log k is the best we can do. And uh, I'm actually going to start with a technical hook, which I think is uh, in terms of technical tricks, it's the most interesting part of our paper. So we define this query resistant code. It's a mapping for some alphabet to n bit strings, such that you basically need to query half the strings to find out anything interesting about x. So part of the challenge from previous work from getting uh, asymptotically tight query complexity bounds is that the lower bounds were based on uh, the number of cells you probed for a function which had a large alphabet. So this is how we get rid of uh, the loss vector there. Um, so I'm going to actually start the development from the bottom of this slide and go up. So I'll show the query resistant codes. Um, I'll show this function and, and show how uh, we get this large blow up. And if there's remaining time, uh, we'll do the strong direct sum at the end. OK, so let's see what a query resistant code is. Um, so I'm going to define delta n query resistant code of some alphabet sigma. sigma. It's, you can think of it as a probabilistic encoding. So I'm going to take each uh, letter in sigma, and I'm going to map it to a distribution on n-bit strings. We need the distributions to be disjoint, and we need them to partition all the n-bit strings. And the uh, technical requirement here is that uh, no matter what bits of the encoding that you probe, um, information theoretically, you learn nothing about the original x, which is to say that these two distributions are exactly the same no matter what bits you probe and no matter what value you get, you get out of it. OK, uh, it can be useful also to talk about the decoding function. So because they partition these set of all n-bit strings, uh, you give me an n-bit string, I'm going to give you the x, which is in the support of that distribution. 
And in our paper, we, we have a construction of an N over 2 query resistant code. Um, all the technical details are uh, not actually ours. We're, they're essentially under the hood. It's uh, KY's uniform distribution. Um, so let's show how to use a query resistant code. So given any uh, function on a large alphabet, um, you can describe a new function that uses just bit probes in the natural way. So if I've got an array of n different uh, n bit strings, I'm just going to take each one of those n bit strings, decode it, and then apply the original function. So the main hook here is it, it doesn't matter what f and sigma are. If you've got this uh, query resistant code, um, then the number of cells you probe here can be less than or equal to n over 2 times the query complexity of the larger function. So if you flip that around, this says essentially uh, you need to do whatever you did for lowercase f, um, but probe all the bits in each cell every time you do it. Um, the construction is quite simple. So I'm going to take my algorithm for f, and here's my algorithm for little f. So uh, x1 through xn is my input for little f. I'm going to apply my query resistant code on each letter, each uh, cell in my string. And then I'm just going to emulate a. So by the error guarantees of this uh, query algorithm a, for every single input, we have error probability at most delta. Uh, sorry, error, abort probability at most delta, error probability at most epsilon. So this, uh, this, this input that I'm feeding into A is, is now a distribution on inputs for capital F. But we get the same error guarantees. Um, so the trick is how to do this in a, in a query efficient way for little f. And uh, all we're going to do is keep on sampling whatever this bit is, whichever bits uh, this algorithm A probes. Um, until we end up sampling half the bits in one cell. And then we sample the original thing and, and then just move on with our day. So the fact that uh, these two distributions, g of x and g of x prime, are equal, uh, conditioned on probing any, uh, any set of bits and whatever those values they are, let us do this efficiently. So we don't actually need to know what xi is to do this initial sampling because this conditional distribution is always going to be the same. Um, up until some barrier given by our query resistant code. And then once we get to that barrier, then uh, we just probe the original input and then keep going. Um, so uh, every single time we probe a bit, uh, a cell on our, our function f, uh, we don't do that until after we probe n over 2 bits for the original function. So, the number of cells we probe is a 2 over n factor. So the goal here is to reduce the alphabet of the decision uh, of the query thing? Or so, so what did we gain by this reduction? Yeah, so what did we gain by this reduction? So I'm trying to show that uh, in here, we're making kind of powerful queries. So we're not probing bits here. We're probing characters in our alphabet, which might be actually large. So uh, I care about tight asymptotic bounds for bit probes. So I needed a construction which kind of forced us to probe essentially the entire contents of one cell. Are there any other questions about this algorithm? OK. Um, so in a, in a second, I'm going to show you the function where we end up getting tight asymptotic bounds on the query complexity. Um, the way we actually prove this is by going through a chain of intermediate functions. And all of our actual reductions are randomized reductions very similar to the flavor of this. So I'll give you the, the suite of functions we actually look at. Um, the first function is, is super simple. It's, it's just gap identity. You've got an n-bit string. You want to output 1 if it's all zeros. Um, output 0 if half the bits are 1. So in the Ambanus et al. paper, um, you use this, uh, they use this as intuition for their lower bound. We're going to make our lower bound explicit and explicitly rely on this. So 
we can show that even with a constant fraction of aborts, um, the query complexity of this is log of one over epsilon up until epsilon gets to like two to the minus n over two or approximately. So our, our next intermediate function, I've, I've got a picture up here. So your, your input's uh, an n by n grid of cells. Cells can be black, red, or blue. And there's a promise that each column has a, uh, a unique cell that's not black. And there's also a promise that all of the non-black cells are either all red or half are red and half are blue. And you just want to distinguish which one it is. So we, we can do a reduction from gap by D to show that um, the query complexity of blue-red scales by factor of M over gap identity. Uh, our, our next function is this pointer function. It's on the board. It, it was in both of the previous query complexity papers. Um, so you might have seen it before. Um, I, I thought this would make a terrible slide. Uh, so I wrote it on the board. And, and in hindsight, I think I've just transferred the, the measure of terribleness over to whiteboards. <laughs> um, so the input again here is, is an m by n grid. But uh, this time, the cells are really fat. So there's a lot of information in each cell. Um, in particular, each cell contains a value bit, a back pointer to a different cell, and what I call a tree pointer. So there's going to be roughly root n different tree pointers. And we want to output one if and only if a series of conditions happens. And I want to emphasize that this is very, very similar in flavor to the previous work. So I'm not claiming originality here. So uh, we want to output one if there's a unique special column where the value of every entry of all the cells in the column is one. Um, and within that column, there's a unique special cell. And all the other uh, cells in the unique special column have null pointers on all their pointers. And in all the other columns that are not the special column, there's going to be at least one cell with value 0. And all of these cells are going to be pointed to by a depth 2 tree. So these root n pointers are going to go out to root n different nodes. These are going to go out to root n different nodes. Total size of the tree is going to be uh, just n. Um, we require all the nodes in this depth 2 tree to be uh, one cell in each column. And again, the value of all these are going to be 0 except for this special element the root of this tree. Um, and the last thing is, uh, for half of these nodes off the special column, uh, all the pointers are null. And then for the other half, they point back to the special cell. So I think the intuition here is we're embedding an instance of gap identity in here. Um, the trick is to how to figure out how to find uh, this special column efficiently. These back pointers are going to help you do it. OK, and the last function we've uh, essentially already done. So uh, once we have pointer function, we're just going to slap the query resistant code onto it. And that reduction is all already done generically. OK, so chaining together all the theorems I listed here, um, this is going to give a lower bound of the encoding function of uh, n times m times log 1 over epsilon. And in the Mbanus paper, they have an upper bound. Uh, you can massage it for us, uh, and it, it ends up being tight. So this encoding function is the, the function where we have asymptotically tight query complexity on the bits. Um, are there any questions at this point on this function? So, so maybe I lost some of the details, but is it a total function in the end or a, or a partial function? Yeah, so this is a total function. Um, so. Pointer function's total. It's important that it's total. Um, this separation between zero error and epsilon error has been known for a long time for partial functions. So this is actually a good point to point out. So this pointer function, um, I haven't really fully specified the input. I've only specified when you're supposed to output one. And if you ever get any violation in here, you're supposed to output zero. So it is a total function. OK, 
So as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Ambanus et al. used a very similar pointer function, which is apparently based on uh, the, an original paper by um, Gus Patassi and Watson. Um, the main difference for them is that they have uh, just two pointers down. So their tree ends up being a log n binary tree. And they lose a log factor because they crawl down the tree. We have a depth two tree, so we lose a constant factor. Um, so the Embanus et al. paper, in their paper, they, they say that they take intuition from gap identity. We make it explicit here. So I want to give you a, a quick sketch, uh, lower bound for gap identity. Uh, I've got a hard distribution, uh, which is based on delta and epsilon. Um, so with probability alpha, which is you should think of it as delta, uh, if you think of epsilon as small. So with probability alpha, we've got an all zero string. Otherwise, it's a uniform uh, string over the yes inputs. And uh, I should mention at this point, like. As far as I know, this is the first time people have studied query complexity with aborts and errors. So we don't have general techniques for proving lower bounds when we have these aborts in query complexity. Um, so the way we ended up doing this is by this chain of reductions. One of the reasons why we do that is because gap identity is so simple and so restrictive that we can actually prove a lower bound using aborts. Um, so uh, for the sake of contradiction, take a, an appropriate algorithm for gap identity. And I want to mention that without loss of generality, I can assume that as soon as we see a 1, we know that we're not the all 0 string. So there's no reason to not just output 0 in the other case. So we can assume that uh, every single gap identity protocol is just a very narrow uh, binary tree. As soon as we see a 1, we're going to output 0. Let me use a different color here. So 0 is all the way down. We can get a lower bound because uh, without loss of generality, we can assume the decision tree looks like this. And there's only one node where we don't have the output already fixed. So based on the hard distribution, we can look at what happens when we decide to abort here, and what happens when we decide to output 0, and what happens when we decide to output 1. Uh, there's only three cases. In all three cases, either the abort probability is too large, or the error probability is too large. And this contradicts the guarantee of my deterministic decision tree. So that's it for the gap ID identity lower bound. Um, all the other reductions are going to be only slightly more complicated than this. So the next reduction, I'm um, going to connect gap identity to blue-red. Um, the only novelty here is uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to map every input that's 0 to a red cell, every input that's 1 to a blue cell. And I'm going to randomize where I place these cells uh, in my uh, blue-red input. And we do have an increase in abort probability of 1 over 10. So we're going to emulate the algorithm for blue-red based on this. If we ever have to probe an entry that's not one of these colored cells, my emulator knows that it's supposed to be a black entry. So I'm just going to return that without probing. Um, if it's a colored entry, we're going to go query the input bit. Again, if it's 0, we output, uh, we say it's red. If it's 1, we can say it's blue. Uh, we can also just stop the emulation right now because we know that we're in the no instance. Um, so the only question is what happens when we run out, when we query too many cells. And uh, you should expect us to query roughly n over 2 cells, m over 2. Um, and this turns out to be true. So you can't query more than 7q over m. Um, this is. Uh, a little bit technical, but hopefully not too hard. Um, so I want to look at any column and note that because the emulating algorithm placed this colored entry uniformly, no matter what the blue-red algorithm does, the probability that I find a colored entry in my kth query is exactly 1 divided by the number of rows. So if you look at any leaf in this algorithm, and count the number of colored entries I find, 
the probability mass of reaching that leaf is 1 over m to the t. And so then we're just going to iterate, calculate all the k choose t possible cells that have exactly t um, colored entries. And this sum telescopes, and the overall probability is 1 over 10. So we abort if we uh, probe too many cells. Otherwise, uh, we get the same error and abort guarantees that we had before. Um, the last reduction that we have here um, is connecting blue-red to the pointer function. And this one, I think, is a, is a little bit subtle. So um, any black input, any black cell, I'm going to map to uh, 1 with all bottom pointers. Any red cell, we're going to map to 0 with all bottom pointers. And the emulating algorithm doesn't know how to map the blue cells. So these blue cells intuitively are going to map into uh, these inputs with value 0, but back pointers to the special cell. And without knowing exactly where the set of all the blue entries are, like we don't actually know uh, how to do this mapping. But the win here is we don't need to because as soon as we query a blue cell, then we know that we know what the output is. So we're going to halt the emulation. So uh, the only last piece here is uh, we, we do get a bump up in error. And the only error that happens, so it, note that if we're in a no instance, so sorry, if we're in a yes instance, which means that all the colored entries are red, uh, the emulating algorithm can just emulate the entire algorithm. It knows how to do that. So the abort and error probability are not going to jump up at all. The only question is what happens when I'm half red and half blue? And I'm going to calculate an upper bound on the error that this emulating algorithm probes only red colored cells and doesn't notice that we're in the blue case. And I claim this can be at most 2 times epsilon. And the proof is just look at any pointer function input that's consistent with this blue-red input. So I've got uh, a one output. So there is some special column. There is a unique special cell. Uh, the map from blue-red to this is that special cell is blue, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so take any input that's uh, uh, one input for pointer function that's consistent with that x. And then I'm going to create another z prime, which just flips the value of this special cell. So one of these is a no input. One of these is a yes input. The only way or place they're different is in this special cell. And, and our algorithm is supposed to have abort delta and error probability epsilon. So um, if we don't query this special cell, then we're going to have too much error. So. Um, it's not only the probability that no blue entries are queried, it's the probability that the special entry isn't queried. And that's at most 2 times epsilon. OK, so the reduction from pointer function to encoding function, we already did at the beginning. That was uh, a generic application of this query resistant code. So that actually completes our chain of reductions, which shows a lower bound for the encoding function. Um, OK, uh, we have. Three minutes left. Um, I'm going to skip the strong direct sum theorem because I think it's going to take approximately six minutes. Um, <laughs> but uh, you all, almost all of you have done direct sum. Like This is all just one big technical Markov argument. Um, I think it's going to be more useful to talk about open problems. So. Uh, it, as I, I think I mentioned already, this, this is new research. We haven't submitted it yet. Um, neither one of us were query complexity experts when we started this. Um, so I think there are a lot of uh, questions that I find interesting. So um, the, I think the biggest uh, drawback to this query resistant code right now is the construction that we have blows up the length of, or the size of the code by an exponential factor. So. Our strong direct sum ends up working as long as epsilon is not smaller than like inverse quasi-polynomial, which is pretty good. But I think you should have a scaling with epsilon that goes all the way down to exponentially small error. Um, the only thing that's holding us back right now is the inefficiency of this query-resistant code. And I think our construction actually is a lot stronger than we need. 
So maybe there's a more efficient code. Uh, we have one function that's robust to aborts. I think it would be interesting to characterize which functions that are robust to aborts. And I think the most interesting next direction for me is this strong direct sum for composed functions, which uh, maybe not the strong direct sum part, but uh, the composed functions Troy will talk about in 30 seconds. <laughs> Complexity with aborts? Probably communication. No, that's communication. Complexity. Okay. But we have applications to communication complexity as well. So, because you mentioned streaming, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I'm just curious as to how those two models. Come so, so. Familiar with what people are talking about? Uh, I'm not familiar with the Kiranai's paper, the specific one you're talking about. So, that would be good for me to become more familiar with. Shows that information complexity is. Oh, is this the like the zero error? Right, right, the zero error. This, right. Or zero communication. Zero communication. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, so uh, just to sum up for everyone, so JRAM is talking about a communication complexity paper, which also uses aborts, and I haven't thought about that connection. The work from communication complexity that. Uh, I'm most familiar with that talks about aborts is this strong direct sum uh, that Gregory and David and Marco Monaro did. <coughs> and, and there, the strong direct sum theorem is, is conceptually very similar. Um, we try to, here, I'll just do this one page without the analysis. Um, the idea here is that because we want to compute FK with overall error epsilon, Intuitively, computing each particular entry should have error roughly epsilon over k. So we're going to compute some function f on one co coordinate by embedding into an appropriate coordinate. Um, so the idea to use aborts here and uh, the high-level conceptual way to do it is, is very similar to Gregory's paper. Um, uh, I think the biggest drawback from my communication complexity perspective with Gregory's papers. The strong direct sum works for interactive complexity, but in practice, interactive complexity with aborts and errors uh, for information complexity. Like we, we don't know how to use it except for one-way communication, typically. Gregory says yes. So. so you're missing some omega or O or something in the theorem? What was that? Uh, oh, yes, we are. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, omega should not be equal. Equals omega. Let's thank Josh Wiggins.